Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Hello everyone, it's Mickey here. You're listening to Wikipedia, and this week on the podcast, I'm diving into the science of cold water swimming with Dr. Heather Massey. She's a senior lecturer in the Extreme Environments Laboratory at the University of Portsmouth. And that's where she spends a lot of her time researching science of cold water immersion. She's published a number of studies that make up some of the recent scientific research into the benefits of cold water swimming for physical and mental health. We talk 101 about what even is cold water? What are the mechanisms behind how it works? How long do we have to be in there for? What actually happens versus what do people think happens? Because they've also published research on people's perceptions of cold water swimming and what we need to be mindful of in terms of not just the health benefits but are there any risks associated with it and also what her laboratory is currently studying. We also briefly touch on heat acclimation at the end of the podcast. So Heather is a senior lecturer in the sport, health and exercise science and a member of the Extreme Environments Laboratory and Clinical Health and Rehabilitation Research Team at the University of Portsmouth. She's also an honorary researcher at Sussex Partnership NHS Foundation Trust and has a varied profile of research studies. So these involve the preparation, selection and support of humans in extreme environments, hypoxia, heat and cold. More recently, as I mentioned, her team is now investigating the impact that these environments have on health conditions. And Heather herself is certainly uh, interested in the cold water scene, having swum the English Channel. Just before we kick off into the interview, I'd just like to remind you that the best way you can support this podcast is to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and tell a mate, even leave a five-star review. That would be amazing. You could go that one step further and subscribe to my recipe portal access on my website, mickeywillardin.com, where for $12 a month, you get access to over 900 recipes regularly updated, my weekly email, which is almost like a little mini research review on a particular topic, access to my real food nutrition group, and the ability to ask me any nutrition-related questions through our in-app messaging system or online portal. I'd also like to remind you that if you're interested in weight loss, at all. I have a webinar coming up, it is free, related to everything weight loss. So the best approach. You guys know that I have my Mondays Matter program that is kicking off early September. This webinar is actually one of the best ways that you can get a great deal going into the Mondays program and I describe all of it in the webinar. So that is Wednesday, August the 24th, 7.30pm We'll put a link to sign up in the show notes here or jump onto Instagram and I have a link in the link tree in my bio. All right, team, please enjoy this conversation that I had with Heather Massey. Heather, thank you so much for taking time out of your morning to chat to me today. I'm super excited to chat about um, all things cold, maybe a little bit about heat, but the extreme sort of environment stuff, um, which obviously you, uh, not only you work in, but you have, a, you know, a personal interest, as I understand, as well. So um, first, the first, my first question really is, did you find cold water immersion and ice swimming, or did it find you? Like, what was it that sort of got you into it? Because as I understand, you have swum the channel and you've competed in the World Ice Swimming Championships. 
Is it a coincidence or what's the story? Oh, okay. So the story really goes back to my father's basically responsible. My dad, um, he's a, he was a keen, he was a keen dinghy sailor and, um, he wasn't a very good dinghy sailor because <laughs> myself and my brother would always end up in the water. Um, <laughs> so we were frequently messing about in boats, uh, on our local canals and, uh, in the sea, uh, just enjoying being in the dinghy. And I just gradually learned that, I actually enjoyed being in the water more than I enjoyed being in the boat. So as a kid, that's what I ended up doing was just spending lots of time in the water and then, um, sort of moved away from it a little bit as a, as a teenager, you become a bit more body conscious mm-hmm. and, um, ended up after a sort of a career in hockey and football and rugby, um, spending a lot of time rehabilitating in in swimming pools uh, mm. because of getting injured. And then from there, just gradually thought, well, I'm spending more time in the water uh, rehabilitating than I'm actually spending on the pitch. I should go back into swimming, which was my original first love. And yeah, really just carried on from there thinking, well, I still want to be a bit competitive and mm-hmm. I still want to challenge myself. Mm-hmm. And these are things that, you know, I can push and do now. So yeah, that's a, a happy accident, but also, um, uh, t- sort of my research interests, but also sort of being sparked at the same time. So yeah, a bit of both really. They found me and I found it. Yeah. So Heather, with that, like you, the ice swimming championships, sound quite extreme actually what is and it's similar obviously swimming the channel um did you potentially and and I'm going to ask you some sort of 101 questions actually as to cold water swimming and you know what it is scientifically I guess speaking but um did you yourself notice benefits that then sort of sparked that interest well, to start with, uh, yeah, swimming the channel and ice swimming are extreme activities. And even in cold water swimming is an extreme mm. activity. So yeah, I would, you don't start by having those goals and aspirations. Um, I started by getting in the, the water in the, in the summer, uh, just enjoying being in that environment. Just noticed that I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, you know, I, maybe it had some sort of um he- uh, health uh implication for me in in terms of i felt more refreshed uh mm. ready for the day as a consequence um but yeah absolutely it's one of those it was a grower um they gradually started to think oh well actually i'm enjoying this i could push it a bit more and go and do the the peer to peer event and then move on to doing longer and longer events and more challenging things so this is something that's crept up over a long period of time this mm. is not uh you know going and swimming the channel or doing an ice swim is not something that you you uh, you start out as a newbie swimmer going i'm going to enter the world ice swimming championships or i'm going to swim the channel these are sort of goals and aspirations that sort of uh, gradually sort of um, occur over time. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, um, you know, you noticed yourself with a little bit more energy or spark, you know, after swimming. And that's one of the things which I really notice when I go into the cold water and probably over the last couple of years have almost made it a priority to try and seek out that experience, uh, particularly during winter, you know, like either um, going for a swim I say swim, actually, I mean a dip, host a run or or making a deal with a friend that we're going to get into the water just down sort of near work. And that feeling of sort of invigoration, and it can happen, oh, I don't know, but it appears, psychologically seems to happen almost immediately. Like You don't have to be in, or I don't necessarily have to be in for a long period of time to get that real sort of mood enhancement. Uh, absolutely, and I would sort of back that up by uh, some of the uh, research that has that has already been done. We know that um, people that have experienced short-term immersion in cold water have increases in the stress hormone responses uh, resulting from the cold shock response, mm. and so um, we, that that includes things like adrenaline, cortisol, but we think it also includes uh, things like increased serotonin levels and uh, beta endorphins, all of which are going to make you feel quite alive and invigorating. Um, and so we've kind of nicknamed that the post-swim high, yeah, um, that. because that's exactly what you feel. 
still, you, you come out of the water and you go, you, you're absolutely buzzing. You're really enjoying what, what's going on. Um, you're more aware of your surroundings, whereas beforehand you might have been a bit tired or fatigued. It sort of, sort of reinvigorates you. Yeah, and in fact, that's how I uh, describe it as well, because as a runner, people often talk about, you know, running endorphins and how good you can feel after a run. And and probably the only thing that comes close that I've noticed is po- it doesn't, you know, the run is almost inconsequential to if I go into the water afterwards. A lot of people talk about running like every single run you're going to go on, you're going to get endorphins. Well, that doesn't happen to me and I've been running for like 30 years. Um, but the the thing that comes close is absolutely that endorphin post swim high that, that you're talking about, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm excited to chat to you to actually sort of delve into what's going on. So my first sort of question, Heather, is, you know, at what temperature is water cold? Well, that's a really good point. Um, and we don't actually have a fixed temperature. Lots of people say, oh, 15 is cold water. Lots of people band about different figures. But cold water is really where you get a physiological response. So we know that uh, you can, the maximum cold shock response peaks uh, between somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees Celsius water temperatures. Mm. But you can still get a cold shock response in 20 degree water temperatures, particularly if you're new to uh, dipping in cold water. So um, there's there's no strict definition of what cold water actually is. Mm, that's interesting because you, you're you right. I do see quite a few numbers sort of bandied about and, and I don't know, like, you know, the ice baths that people um, yeah. do and – I mean, I would love one. My husband hasn't let me have one yet, like a freezer that I can get into. But it sounds a bit dangerous, actually, talking uh, about that. But but everyone appears to be completely safe. But people talk about sort of six degrees and three degrees is, quote, unquote, cold. But that's not necessarily the case. No, I think that that's you're bordering on freezing cold temperatures uh, there, and um, cold water comes with you know those potential benefits that uh, we're still researching, uh, but it does come with some definite risks associated with it, and one of those risks that's little known is something called non-freezing cold injury, oh. and this is uh, related to being in cold or ice cold water uh, and can and can cause quite serious damage and pain uh, to your fingers or any other extremities that are exposed to it. So sitting or, or lying in cold water um, is not something I would recommend. Um, mm. If you're going to go and swim in cold water, then then go and swim in cold water uh, rather than sit in ice cold baths um, with your your there is the possibility that you could cause some um, temporary um, nerve damage and definitely some pain associated with the condition of non-freezing cold injury. So I definitely advise against um, static immersion in ice cold water. It's not really uh, it, it, just to protect your body from, from the potential for non-freezing cold injury. Yeah, and I guess that's uh, what we love to do as humans is take an idea and absolutely take it to the extreme. So, yeah, in this case, um, colder is not always better. And and longer, and swimming for longer in colder water is not always better. Yeah, yeah. Um, Heather, you're, you mentioned that the cold shock proteins are stimulated at you know, potentially that 10 to 15 degrees, yet they can be stimulated in, say, 20 degrees, depending on the, I guess, the tolerance of the individual. Does time come into it as well? So will you, so I guess my first question is, what's actually going on um, in addition to the cold shock proteins that uh, are activated with cold? And does the length of time change the degree of coldness that you need the water to be at? Okay, so the cold shock response yep. consists of a big inspiratory gasp as you enter the cold water, as, as your skin cools down, and then a subsequent rapid breathing, a hyperventilation. It's also accompanied by a big increase in blood pressure and mm. also increase in heart rate as well, as well as the hormonal responses that we've 
we talked about. Now, um, the cold shock response sort of peaks within the first 30 seconds of immersion in the cold water. So if we're looking at cold water immersion to the neck with the head mm. out, this the, the cold shock response will peak within the first 30 seconds. And depending on how cold it is, it might it might last for uh, a minute, two minutes. Um, it might last slightly longer uh, if it's colder or you're not so well habituated. Mm. Now, that magnitude of those responses, as you say, really does depend on how uh, how habituated you are, how regularly you go cold swimming. So if you're um, a, new, a person that's new to cold swimming, you can expect that you're going to have a much bigger response to the cold shock, to going into the cold water, than somebody that has done it regularly. Um, so uh, your, your responses may may last for uh, three to three to four minutes in cold water, whereas somebody that is regularly exposed may have a very small increase in, in their breathing and be able to very quickly uh, overcome that cold shock response. So it may be that their cold shock response less lasts than a minute. So yeah, it's very, very variable. Yeah, and do you get the same benefits the more habituated you get or do they diminish because you're not getting that sort of cold shock response? That's a really good question and I haven't a clue. We don't know the answer mm. to that. Mm. Um, we we think, we think based on some evidence, uh, but this is all uh, sort of uh, qualitative and anecdotal evidence, that people that are in the water for uh, a, small, a shorter length of time will have improvements in mood, whereas those that extend their stay and develop uh, deep body temperatures that are cool to the point of hypothermia, obviously their mood uh, may change uh, to more sort of negative moods. So, mm. But this is all anecdotal evidence. There's no sort of science uh, behind a strong, uh, re um, rigorous science behind that. Yeah. So um, at the moment, I can't really answer that question. Mm. Uh, we haven't done the research. Mm, okay. And what about, because I, typically I might be habituated to the cold. And what I notice is, depending on the type of cold, is that I'll get out of the water and um, dry off and, and put clothes on. But it does take a significant amount of time to sort of warm up after that. And even if I go into a hot shower, in fact, what I find is that I'm turning the water hotter and hotter and hotter and not actually getting warm. So I suppose, what are the, are there any additional benefits from remaining cold? Is it sort of dangerous to not warm yourself up immediately? Are there any sort of uh, studied guidelines as to the best approach or um, more, more benefits from being cold, I suppose? Um, okay, so there are definite, some definite reasons why you should rewarm. Um, so uh, post your uh, immersion in cold water, um, you're going to find that you have uh, a continued cooling response. Mm. That is a normal physiological response. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just as uh, the tissues of the body uh, start to conduct the cool to the deep body. Uh, they're followed by warmer uh, tissue, uh, warmer um, uh warmer tissues because obviously you, you kind of warm from either the muscles or from the exterior of your body to the interior of your body. So uh, what you find is that those warm fronts are chasing the cold front through your body. So you gradually find that uh, your, your body will continue to cool for up to about 30 minutes after mm. you've been in cold water, especially if you've been in for a long period of time and started to cool the deep body. Now, um, so you're going to be much colder after you've been in the water, uh, uh, sorry, after you've been out of the water for 20, 30 minutes than you were when you initially got out. Mm. So, um, and that's absolutely normal. And so what then will happen is physiologically, you may well be defending your deep body temperature by shivering, by doing a little bit of exercise, uh, insulating your body, uh, having taken off your wet clothes. And so gradually your body temperature will uh, return to uh, it, its normal level for that time of, of day. So it will take quite a long time for that process to happen. We can speed it up a little bit by doing uh, some light exercise. I mean, really light exercise. So walking around, if you feel coordinated enough to do so. Um, I would suggest, um, I would suggest 
if you're going to if you're going to shower, leave it until you've had that initial 30 minutes uh, to get to the point of the coolest part before you go and have a warm shower, not necessarily mm. a hot shower. Yes. Uh, the reason we suggest that is that there's two reasons for that. Really, is that um, with with showering, it's very easy to have a very quick shower and you feel very comfortable very quickly because your your uh, thermal comfort is driven mainly by your skin. Yeah. And so um, what will happen is you turn the shower on nice and warm and you get nice warm skin. You think, oh, great, I've rewarmed. Fantastic. Um, so then you get out of the shower and as soon as you, uh, as soon as the skin has cooled back down again, you'll start to shiver again. So mm -hmm. you haven't actually cool, you haven't actually rewarmed properly. What you've done is you've removed the, uh, the, the sensation of cooling from the skin, which has, uh, stopped you shivering so this comes on to the second reason so the, the warm shower feels comfortable but actually hasn't rewarmed you yeah. uh, it's the shivering and the light a light amount of exercise that will help to generate the heat that you need to then uh, rewarm properly yeah. Okay. No, that makes complete sense. And also I sort of half worry that I'm going to end up scolding myself before I actually feel particularly, you know, like I've, it's actually done the job. So it's good to sort of get clarification. This may seem like a ridiculous question, but hot drinks, is that going to help? Oh, it's nice. It's nice yeah. to have a hot drink. Yeah. It's great to Put your hands around a, a, a mug that's moderately warm, not too hot, obviously. You don't want to scold yourself. Now, the volume of water in a hot drink compared to uh, yourself as a bag of water. Yeah. Oh, yeah so okay. if you've got a, 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 a I don't know, we'll, we'll say a generous size cup, it might be half a litre of warm yeah. water. You might be 60, uh, 60 kilos of water. So if you add a warm cup of fluid to 60 kilos of water, it's going to have very little impact on elevating your deep body temperature. But what it does do is make your fingers feel more comfortable as you're holding it. And we think there's, you know, some pleasure in having warm fluid going in when you're, when you're drinking it. Yeah. Uh, we haven't really identified why or how that's happening, but we we'll say it's not going to have any impact on your deep body temperature, but it does feel good. That's, do you know, as you were sitting there talking to me, I'm like, oh my goodness, of course, you you know, that makes so much sense. But my, like in my brain, I'm like, oh, but it feels so good. And potentially for the reasons that you're just describing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Heather, so there's obviously this cold water immersion. What about um, cold showers? Are we getting the same benefits from going into the cold water um, in the sea or in a lake, for example, compared to, say, jumping into a cold shower? Okay, so there's two different things going on there. So with a cold shower, you're not um, you're not uh, wetting the whole of the body in the same way that you would wet uh, the, the same surface area of water uh, of the body in in water. Um, so you might not be uh, uh, initiating sort of the, the cold shock response to the same level uh, mm. as you would in immersion in cold water. But also the the, the idea that um, that that a cold water swim is just solely related to being cold. Um, we're not convinced by that. It, yeah. There's lots of other things going on when you go for a cold swim. You go with a group of people that uh, you enjoy their company with. You're in nature. Uh, you're challenging yourself to, uh, you know, a unique environment or a unique challenge. It's a distraction. There's lots of other things going on. So, yeah which you're not getting from being in a cold shower on your own. So it, it, it is likely that the cold water swim is more than just being, uh, just being immersed in cold water. Yeah, that's such a good point, actually. And I wanted to ask you about a case study that I believe you co-authored on a woman who um, experienced major depressive disorder and her cold water swimming was part of a protocol to get her feeling better. Can you describe, I, I suppose, just outline that case study for us and sort of where it's led you with regards to your research? Yeah, sure. So we did this, oh gosh, quite a while back when 
when swimming in cold water was actually seen as like a weird thing to do. So it's quite a while ago. Um, so th this lady had had quite severe depression for a prolonged period of time. And it was uh, fairly drug resistant uh, and left her sort of feeling quite foggy and cloudy and uh, lack clarity. So um, she she didn't really want to take medication and was, was really looking for alternatives which left her... Uh, feeling slightly more clear uh, mm. than, um, than than any of the medication routes that she'd had open to her. So we we were, came along, it was more of a television programme, unfortunately, rather than the science leading the way. Mm. Uh, we were invited to be part of it because a lot of our research focuses around water safety and keeping people safe in water. And that's always been our primary goal, is to keep people safe in water. So we we were sort of leading on it from that angle, is that we were there to support this lady uh, going into the cold water, but keeping her safe. Mm. Um, you know, if if it had no impact, then the important thing was that she was she was safe. And we gradually started to notice that yes, her mood lightened. Um, we got her some open water swim coach uh, lessons so that she she could do it safely uh, with somebody else and feel supported in the environment that she was swimming in. And gradually over time, she reduced her, her medication dose and gradually came off it off the medication about four or five months after um, we started the, the cold water swimming. And then was off her medication for, for 18 months after that. So yeah, she'd had a quite, uh, and before we wrote the, uh, the case study. So it's quite uh, an interesting sort of experience for her and for us as well. So that's kind of why we wrote it up as um, a case study. Mm. Uh, just because we'd, we'd had this experience and she, she wanted to share that experience. But it, it led us to think, well, if it's happening to her, could we... Could it help or could it be used by other people? Mm. And so since then, we've done a number of different studies uh, that have looked at well-being and uh, burnout in uh, in groups of people using a fairly similar model where we've had swim coaches help people that are new to outdoor swimming uh, to get into the water in a controlled way, uh, in a control, uh, you know, mitigating all the potential risks that uh, they could have mm. and really really just trying to find out how it supported them with huge changes in well-being, uh, reductions in burnout as a consequence. And that's happened in people that were considered themselves physically and mentally uh, well. Mm -hmm. We've also uh, recently and hopefully about to publish a study looking at a group with uh, lived experience of depression mm -hmm. and uh, getting them into uh, groups of swim groups and found big reductions in their symptoms of depression to the point where many of them would be classed as having no depressive symptoms and wow. that those those reduced uh, symptoms were uh, were maintained over three months after the initial swim course. So it's looking like some fairly promising results. But these studies so far lack rigour in terms of clinical trial rigour. Mm. And that's the next step, which is what we're recruiting for at the moment, are studies that uh, look at something called a randomised control trial. Mm. Um, so basically what you have are two groups one who have the intervention and another who don't have that intervention. And you compare the results of the two groups to see what's happening. So that has a lot more rigor to the experimental process than just having one group that you all, that you give the, the, the outdoor swimming or intervention to, to see what happens to them at the end. Mm. Um, and so we're not what we're what we're not trying to do is replace uh, any treatments or drug therapies mm. but offer a potential alternative to some people that may be able to uh, use outdoor swimming to support their um uh, reduction in their symptoms mm. now we know this isn't going to work for everybody mm. but what we do want to know is who does it work for and yeah. why um, yeah. And from that, we can start to really sort of distill out um, how we can help people, whether it's actually being in the cold water that's that's helping them or whether it's other aspects that, uh, as I've mentioned before, is it the nature? Is it the group? Is it the challenge? So all yeah. of these sorts of things may be really useful to understand because there'll be a number of people that either can't access uh, cold water or mm. 
either or for health reasons they're not able to yeah. or that they don't want to but there yeah. are other activities that might be equally um supportive uh, that they may find equally supportive that they may benefit from so it's more than just looking at, you know, cold swimming as an activity, but are there other nature-based activities that could be alternative activities to other, to, to therapies uh, and medications for people with uh, lived experience of depression? Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I am aware of a number of studies looking in that green space area of the potential mechanisms for how depression and, and things are reduced by just being in nature. And even, like, I find it so fascinating thinking, this is a slight tangent, but how changing the um, sort of outlook in a hospital, for example, can change the potential recovery outcomes for people who are in their depending on whether or not they're you know, in a room that has no windows versus a room that might even look over in a park or that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just having pictures of nature yes. uh, has improved, uh, is known to have uh, improved uh, well-being of, of patients. And uh, for us, there's a, a number of uh, studies out there that have looked at just proximity to green or yeah. blue environments. And it doesn't mean that you have to immerse yourself in the na in nature, but just having close proximity to that green or that blue environment has known uh, improvements in well-being. Yeah. So you don't have to immerse yourself in a particular activity. It's just having that knowledge that you're close to that area that's supportive of, of improved well-being. Yeah, I find that so interesting. And, and I've heard people describe sort of, you know, as humans that we are actually part of the natural environment, despite the fact that we are, you know, not necessarily living in it. So I guess from a, a an evolutionary perspective, maybe that's, you know, it makes a little bit of sense if you have that lens put over it. Um, Heather, with regards to the cold water swimming, just a couple of questions. One is... Um, how often per week are the groups, and I know, again, this isn't an RCT, so you, we can't definitively sort of prescribe anything, but in your research, how often were these people doing their open water swimming? And and my question after that is, is it, are the, do the benefits persist even if they stop swimming? So do you, do we know anything in that realm? Um, good question. So the the groups that we've uh, we've researched with either either go swimming once or twice a week. Mm. Um, it's no it's no definite prescription on that. It's just because people are available. That's, yeah. that's when people have time that they're available to go. So there was no sort of rationale behind only having it once or twice a week. It was just that that's that's when there was a greater availability. Mm. Now, um, in terms of um, Sorry, I've forgotten the same part of the question. Oh, no, no, that's right. The when, if the benefits persist, if someone stops oh, doing right. it. Yeah. Good question. Um, so from the work that we've done so far, we've followed them up for only a very short period of time. Mm. Uh, so the case study, for instance, we followed her up for 18 months. Now, she carried on swimming, um, although more irregularly uh, without a swim coach, mm. um, for that entire time and, and found a uh, benefit. Mm. Um, in those that we've followed up, the majority have found ways to carry on swimming um, and found um, and found benefit. Those that have not carried it on were far fewer. And so we don't have the numbers available within the research to say whether there's a definite split and a return to um, uh, increased symptoms of, of, uh, of depression to, to be able to make a definite, or those that carry on will maintain that reduction and those that don't will have another elevation or escalation in their symptoms. So we just don't have the evidence to to say that um, purely because of the, the small numbers that we're dealing with. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Heather, you mentioned um, earlier that being immersing yourself in cold up to your head has the particular benefits. Is, is there anything different if you fully submerse versus just you know leaving your head out of the water like yeah so so immersing the body to the neck mm. uh, results in the cold shock response so that increased breathing the increase in heart rate and blood pressure mm. whereas if you put your face and head in cold water what happens is you get something called the dive reflex which has the exact opposite effect ah. in terms of it's reducing your heart rate um 
it's it's the calming effect. So if you if you liken it to the um the cold shock response being the accelerator pedal mm -hmm. on your on your car, mm -hmm. the dive reflex is the brake. And so the accelerator pedal will increase your heart rate and the brake, uh, the head in uh, cold water, uh, will try to reduce your heart rate. So it has the exact opposite effect. Now, this is why we strongly recommend that when people do go outdoor swimming is that they get into the cold water gently and yes. slowly yes. so that um, they overcome that cold shock response before immersing the face in cold water. Because mm. we kind of liken if you jump or dive in, so you get both the body and the head in cold water at the same time as putting both pedals down, fully down, so both the accelerator and the brake pedal straight down. So in a car, that's not going to be a good thing. And likewise, we don't think that that's going to be a particularly healthy thing to do. Um particularly in people that have not used to being in cold water. So, yeah, we strongly recommend get into the water nice and slowly, yeah. um, get used to the, the, the feel of the, the, the breathlessness and get let that pass before yeah. splashing your face with cold water. So ideally what we normally say is that once you can speak in full sentences, like you and I are now, then that's when you should start swimming. Okay, now that's really great advice. Uh, and I haven't, Heather, seen any research with your, um, I, I don't believe from your lab, looking at metabolism and cold water therapy, but a lot of people who do it with regards to metabolism. Can you comment on that or, at all, or is that just not the scope of your research? That's not really, we've not really uh, sort of delved into that in any sort of great detail. What we have looked at is the impact that um, repeated immersions in cold water have had mm. um, in terms of the um, the impact on uh, defending your deep body temperature. So yeah. we've looked at what happens to your body if you immerse a person in the water for five or six times for about five minutes versus uh, immersing somebody in water for 90 minutes, so cooling their deep body temperature. And so we found from that that if you immerse people in cold water for the longer period of time, 90 minutes, is that actually what happens is you reduce the deep body temperature at which people will start to shiver mm. and which people will start to defend their deep body temperature. And so actually the, the more habituated and more um, adapted to cold water that you are, the the cooler your body temperature will be before you start to shiver and defend your deep body temperature. Mm. So this is really sort of a warning for, for those that are well, um, uh, well acclimatized swimmers in cold water is that they may not actually know how cold they are mm. purely because they, they, they think because they're not shivering, they're not cold. Mm. So that's sort of where our research has been. Yeah. It's super interesting. Um, Heather, now, as I understand, you have recently published results of a large survey looking at what people think is happening kind of psychologically and physically when they go into, into the water. So um, outside of some of the things we've talked about, um, how on the money are those sort of perceived experiences versus what's, what we actually know is happening? Like I'm just really curious as to what people think is happening. Yeah, I mean, this is – we've – We've moved from a case study to a groundswell of opinion. Yeah. Um, and what we're trying to do is just develop that opinion into um, a more sort of a coordinated response. And that's what the survey was all about. Is It's great that we've got these individual case studies and lots of blogs and information available to us. But that's what we were really trying to do is collate this information together in a, a more sort of coherent manner. And... In terms of the findings that we, we had from the survey, we, there was an overwhelming response that, that uh, people found that or perceived that they had an improvement in their mental health and well-being, mm. uh, followed by uh, some, some changes to um, um, reduction in injury risk or in, injuries that they, that they, they uh, encountered. And so that's really where the majority of uh, people that write about uh, their cold water swimming experiences at the, the angle that they have come from as well. But as I say, we're still to do the sort of the, the more robust, uh, more rigorous studies to say that actually cold water immersion will uh, reduce your symptoms of depression. Mm. Um, and we're, we are working on it. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but we just wanted to 
to see if it's just these dotted individual case studies or actually do people that swim in cold water genuinely feel like this and yeah. and so that was really the aim of the survey was just to to rather than sort of uh, pick up on isolated case studies well let's get a big cohort of people and find yeah. out what they think yeah yeah no it's super interesting um heather you've also investigated the potential impact of beetroot supplementation uh dietary nitrates on people with cold sensitivities and um can you tell us a little bit about you know what you've found and whether or not that would be a helpful strategy? Because I have chatted to a number of people who just cannot stand the cold and they feel like they're really missing out on a potential benefit because um, they just there's no way you would get them in cold water. Yeah, this is an interesting one. This was focused primarily on those with uh, with primary rhinos. Um, um, and we were looking at, uh, so that is really where they have uh, reduced blood flow to normally their fingers or toes. Mm. Um, and it can be, it can come on in sort of uh, spasms, um, normally associated with sort of a cold air or cold water mm. exposure. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, we, we were really mean and fed them beetroot supplements um, for a number of weeks. Now, are you not, are you not a beetroot fan? <laughs> Um, no, I like beetroot, but not the juice you would boil oh, it yeah. in. So yes, it uh, takes on a whole different um, frame. But obviously, what we were using was a beetroot supplement that you could control the amount of nitrate in it. Um, and yeah, so yeah, our, uh, our our volunteers had uh, uh, had placebo beetroot that had the the flavour, but without the nitrate concentration in, or they had the the normal. Um, nitrate rich uh beetroot juice um and they they did uh, we we looked at their acute response and also chronically over a two week period we had our volunteers drink it for two whole weeks uh some of them loved it and some of them absolutely hated it yeah and we we, we found some really interesting things so we found that the in the nitrate rich beetroot that it did improve uh blood flow mm. it, uh following a a, a short uh, immersion in cold water so we're just looking at immersing the hand not yeah. the whole body yeah um but we we found uh, uh, and again we found no impact in the um the 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 placebo the the no nitrate condition mm. so actually we do think that there may be some potential uh benefit there uh but if you you really have to like beetroot um uh, for, for it to uh for it to have an impact yeah. And what's but, happening with the nitrate in the body? What is it about it that's making it increase blood flow? So nitrate is a natural, what we call vasodilator. Mm. And so what it does is it expands the blood vessels close to the surface of the skin. So when you're having a sort of a Raynaud's um, attack, for want of a better phrase, um, that can mean that you uh, that the blood vessels close to the surface of the skin close mm. and prevent blood flowing to the surface of the skin. So this, the nitrate richness, uh, the, sorry, the nitrate in the beetroot will be uh, preventing those uh, blood vessels from, from closing or restricting maintaining the blood flow to the the uh, the, the appendage the the uh, the periphery mm. um, and so maintaining the skin blood flow uh, keeping the skin nice and warm so that's that's the theory behind it yeah. and we've we've proven it to some extent that uh, yeah we can uh, maintain blood flow to a higher level uh, with the beetroot uh, condition so yeah it was um an interesting study. Yeah. And so from that, can we sort of say that, you know, if you do have a condition like Raynard's where we, you are, uh, where it's super uncomfortable to, to do the cold water swimming or something like that, you could potentially try beetroot to see whether it has a noticeable improvement for you? Yeah, I would certainly give it a go. Um, yeah. uh, have, have a, you know, it it is there are palatable uh, beetroot juices on the market or you could make your own you know it's it's a lot cheaper to make your own than try and buy some of the the um the the branded versions um yeah certainly uh, have a go at uh, the 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 beetroot um uh, supplementation yeah. um and see if it, it may be that, that before you try the outdoor swimming yeah um what we we've also suggested to a number of people that do swim and experience uh, symptoms of Raynaud's is that they Raynaud's is often sometimes uh, brought on by 
not only having cool skin, but mm. also having a cool, deep body. Mm. And so actually elevating the deep body temperature so uh, a little bit before you go in the cold water and staying in the cold water for a short period of time mm. may actually, one, prevent uh, an attack occurring or may reduce the symptoms experienced. So those are sorts of things that you may want to try as well. Okay, nice. So it would be a matter of um, doing a spin class or going for a run or maybe doing some jumping jacks or something like that? Absolutely. I don't think necessarily doing a full spin class is needed, but just a small <laughs> elevation in deep body temperature, just not to the point, you, just so you're feeling warm, not necessarily yeah. sweaty. Yeah. Uh, but that may, that may help to reduce any symptoms experienced. Yeah, no, that's great. Now, interesting with the nitrates as a vasodilator, is that in part one of the ergogenic effects when we're thinking about performance and its ability to, does it help us sweat more and cool the body down in hot conditions as well? So what what it does do is it increases blood flow to uh, different areas of the body. So yeah. primarily, in, our, in this case, the beetroot juice, primarily to the the, the periphery yeah. so we can maintain the our, 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 our skin blood flow yeah. um, other vasodilators such as things like GTN sprays are used for those who are having angina attacks oh, yes. um, and they would definitely be performance enhancing uh, in in um, in an athletic population yeah yeah oh interesting um Heather can we pivot to the other extreme and can I just ask you a couple of questions on the research you've done with heat stress yeah sure um so you've recently published a study looking at 11 days of heat acclimation um and its impact on endurance markers and in sort of trained males uh what can you tell us about that so in turn, what we've been looking at is we have looked at the impact that um, hydration, dehydration have had on, on the ability to, of the body to, um, uh, to uh, respond and adapt to being uh, in, in hot environments. Yeah. And so looking at how the markers of dehydration, so things like um, uh, vasopressin and uh, ADHD impact on your ability to uh, to acclimatize to the heat and we've actually found that there's no change in um, your stress response uh, in the response to that so actually well there's no there's no need therefore to dehydrate the body in order to have a performance advantage so absolutely what we and these were over fairly short-term heat exposures so we're talking in the region of 90 minutes mm. um, so Actually, if you're looking over that period of time, then, okay, we've had no advantage in in um, those sort of exposures. But if we had um, a much longer period of exposure, actually dehydrating the body is going to have some significant uh, disadvantages. Mm. So um, absolutely, if you when, when you're hydrating, when you're heat acclimatizing for whatever reason, for performance reasons, or because you're going to a very hot environment for, to work, then actually maintain your hydration status is going to be um, is going to be relatively important in order to be able to function. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes perfect sense. And although obviously the study was done in males, can we expect a female response to be the same? Or now this is an interesting one, and it's massively under researched mm. um, because women are not small men. Mm. Um, we have a completely different hormonal profile. There has been some preliminary work in females done, uh, but off the top of my head, I can't remember yeah, uh, that fine. much about it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the problems with researching in females are very apparent. The The reason that most heat acclimatization studies are done in males because they that males don't have a menstrual cycle yeah. and so their deep body temperature doesn't fluctuate their hormonal responses aren't fluctuating throughout mm. the period of a two to three week period mm. which is traditionally when a heat acclimation study would be undertaken mm. and so it becomes more difficult once you superimpose a menstrual cycle onto a heat acclimation process so yeah it's more challenging from the researchers, but that doesn't mean it sh the work shouldn't be done. No, no. Um, it just needs to be. Uh, it just needs to be more carefully planned. Yeah. And 
many of the reasons why this research hasn't been done is because um, lots of the research around heat acclimatization is undertaken by PhD researchers yeah. and they have a very limited time span in which to collect their data. Yeah. And so you go for the, easy, the low hanging fruit, you do it in the population that it's easiest to access and that's yeah. a male population. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it needs to be properly funded and worked out. Yeah, no, in order to to get the same level of information for women that we have in men. No, that's great. That's um, the really good points. Thanks, Heather. Um, so, Heather, you've got you're currently recruiting for a bigger study in depression and for your randomised control trial. And so, if anyone is in particular listening to this in your neck of the woods, how do they contact you? So, yeah, I can be contacted at our email address, spnt.outside at nhs.net. And we're recruiting, particularly in the areas around Parliament Hill Lido in London, Mm -hmm. in Evesham in Worcestershire, and also in Saunton and uh, Barnstable in North Devon. So they're the sort of the key locations we're looking for uh, participants uh, if they'd like to come and take part. Lovely. And any other research that you're doing right now that you're really excited about, Heather? We're doing some amazing work with uh, the RNLI at the moment. So that's the Royal National Lifeboat Institute, looking at the messages around floating to live. And that's really in its infancy at the moment. Um, But it's hopefully going to be really supportive of further life saving and drowning prevention efforts. Amazing. And finally, Heather, um, are you still swimming? Yeah, absolutely. I was in this morning. Oh, fantastic. That's great. I swim. I get goggle marks that literally last like the whole day. (laughs) Your goggles are on too tight. (laughs) (laughs) I think you're probably right. Heather, thank you so much for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. And I will put links to the studies that we've chatted about today in the show notes, in addition to the contact details for people to uh, find you um, with regards to your your study you're recruiting for now so um thank you so much no problem thank you all righty so um that was super interesting particularly as someone who loves the feeling of cold water thermogenesis i just love that there is so much information out there on what a powerful mood changer it can be. And certainly for those people who have done my most recent Mondays Matter plan, the alumni plan, we also did a cold water thermogenesis challenge there. And predominantly the one thing that people said to me when I asked for their feedback was how good it made them feel. So I highly, highly recommend it if you haven't yet tried it as a regular part of your health routine. Next week on the podcast, I cannot wait to bring to you the conversation that I have with Dr. Christopher Palmer on mental health and the ketogenic diet. Until then, though, you can catch me over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition, over on Twitter and Instagram at Mickey Willardin, or on my website, mickeywillardin.com, where in addition to the recipe portal access, you also are able to sign up to any one of my programs that I have available or book a one-on-one consultation with me. All right, team, until next week, have a good one. See you later.